Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Jessica with Syosset Libraries Turn the Page podcast, and our guest today is a wonderful author. Uh, please introduce yourself. Hey, Jessica. I'm Jocelyn Jackson. Um, I write domestic suspense, and sometimes I used to write Southern fiction. Now I've kind of moved more in a, in a new direction for the last couple of books, um, and I'm in Georgia. Thank you, you for certainly. having me. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Welcome. Um, welcome virtually to Long Island, New York. Um, yes, you certainly do write domestic suspense now. And uh, this newest book, Mother May I, really got me in so many ways for so many reasons. And uh, first, I'm going to invite you to tell the audience what this book is about in your own words. Oh, I would love to. So Mother May I is begins with for all my books for me begin with character. It begins with a woman named Brie Cabot, who was raised on the bare, bare bones end of middle class, like um, you know, barely secure. And she's done really well for herself. She got a scholarship, she got an education, she married very, very well. And now she has a husband she loves, they're very affluent. She has two teenage girls in private school and a baby. And the book begins when she's at the school at her daughter's play rehearsal and she looks away from Robert, the baby, for a minute, just half a minute, and he's gone. And um, there's a note in his place that says, go home. Um, if you want to see your baby again, don't call the police, wait for us to contact you. And if you've ever, if you've ever read any of my books before, um, you, I don't think it's a spoiler to say this is not a straight up kidnap and ransom kind of a book. I mean, in my books, the past is alive, the past has teeth, and the past is coming for Brie Cabot. So that, that's where it begins is when this person takes her child and asks her to do something in order to get him back. And I think one of the things that uh, is most interesting about this book is just how much Bree's current life, um, you know, sort of affects the way she deals with things. She's very much, um, she's very much in tune with the fact that this was not always where she came from. Yeah, I, I think there's a couple of things at work here. Um, you know, Brie has changed socioeconomic classes rather extremely. She's been very upwardly mobile. And um, I, something that I think, and I, I don't think this is a spoiler to say either, because you learn this very, very early. Um, the person who's taken Robert is a woman. It's actually another mother. And it's a mother who comes from the same kind of background that Brie comes from. You know, it's not... It's not, they're not starving, they're not desperately poor, but it's that sort of life where you have your claws in the cliff edge. And if one thing goes wrong, you know, you, how do you cover that? There's no room for emergencies. There's no room for a mistake. And, and it, it, in a lot of ways, like this is a thriller. This is a book that is, a, a, it's a ride. But um, I, I think it's fair to say too, it's also really about like the mechanics of privilege. And if you come from that kind of background, you, you're lucky if you get an opportunity. And if you mess up and aren't perfect in that opportunity, that's the end of your opportunities. Like for, for middle-class kids and upper middle-class kids and rich kids, if you mess up, you've messed up and another opportunity will be along in a minute. And I think another thing you do so well in the book, um, trying again to avoid any kind of spoiler, is talking about the privilege of gender yes. and how that works. Um, Brie, her husband has like, is it, was it his cousin? I'm trying to remember. 
There's yeah, there's yeah. sort of their okay. their mothers are cousins. You know, in the South, everybody's your cousin. You just right, right, of course, of course. <laughs> so they are, their mothers are cousins, <laughs> so they're some kind of second cousin, twice removed situation, but they are definitely family, yeah. Uh and you know, Bree, she her husband is to her this wonderful person and she knows she knows that um, his cousin maybe was not the most wonderful person but understands in the way that business and everything else works sometimes you need good cop bad cop for lack of a better um, so she kind of <laughs> tolerates the fact that her husband does business with his cousin who may not be her favorite person in the world but I mean who who are we if we can't say that everybody who our partner associates with is our favorite person in the world? Right. And and it's, you know, it's it's complicated because they're not just family. They are both lawyers, partners in the same law firm that, you know, there's a lot of nepotism going on there. Yes. And a lot of good old boy network stuff. Yes, yes. I, I just, you know, I've I've kind of, as I've been shifting into this new genre, I, I've, I've done a lot of stuff like you used to before we were in a pandemic. You could go into um, any trial that you wanted to go into and you could just sit and watch court proceedings go on. And a few books ago, my protagonist was a lawyer and I started going into various, she was a family court lawyer. So I was mostly there, but while I was there, um, there was a very, uh, I don't want to say prominent or a very splashy national press murder trial going on. And I had a lawyer who was teaching me about being a lawyer and stuff. And she was like, do you want to go sit in for a little while on this very, very high profile case? And I was like, yes. So we go in and on the defense side, it's like six old white guys all in like power ties and bespoke suits with one very young clearly a paralegal person of color like and th this huge legal team I mean it must have she's like you don't even want to know what that costs to have that group of men sitting there and then on the prosecution side it was like the united lawyers of Benetton like they were so they had sent all the hot shots from the DA's office up against this, so, but they were all like, they, they were all different races and they were all young and they were just beautiful people, just very vibrant, attractive. It, it honestly was like a Shonda Rhimes cast lineup of DAs. They had sent like every <laughs> hot DA they had. Right. And, and so, and it was just really like looking at the new South and the old South having a trial it was really intensely interesting but it it also was probably one of the seeds of genesis for this book like to look at the way the the law works for you if you are white and connected and have are in that network as opposed to how the law works for people like the mother who has taken Bree's child um yeah yeah and I, you know, it really like, it definitely tugged at my heartstrings uh, for, as a mother um, of two little boys for a bunch of reasons. Um, so how old is Robert? And they call him Bumper. That's like the nickname that Bree is trying to push up against uh, her, her husband, who I believe they call him Trey, but like it's um Robert is the name that's kind of passed down. So yes. he's like the third. Uh, so he's been calling baby Robert Bumper, which Bree is not a huge fan of. No, um. Bree wants to be called Robert. Um, yeah, so Trey is Robert the third and Bumper is Robert the fourth um but th they have a their daughters are 12 and 13 years old so the joke was he was the bumper crop because he was an oops baby you know they hit they hit 40 and they're like Whoa, whoops <laughs> that sometimes we, we were done <laughs> yes but they're i mean they they're happy about it he's a happy bumper crop um yeah so i don't know i i guess the i guess one of the things that really interested me about that was the fact that like Brie and this other mother really do connect in this sort of terrible way 
where they have empathy for each other and they they understand each other. At the same time, each one of them is actually fighting for their own child. So there's no way to compromise on that. It's like, I feel for you, I see where you're coming from, but we are headed for a conflagration and it is unstoppable because the stakes are so high. Of course, yeah, um, and that was a very interesting. There was a lot between the two of them where they were feeling each other out and um, you know obviously the mo the other mother made um, you know some assumptions about Brie uh, being married to somebody like Trey in this law for law firm um, about you know what she must have been like and Brie you know through certain codes about just some of the things that happened to her when she grew up Brie mentions how, you know, when she was younger, she shopped at a thrift shop, but she wouldn't shop at a local thrift shop because it's possible she could buy clothes that somebody else donated or, you know, it could be, oh, she could be aware, she could be found out basically that she's hanging on that edge, as you mentioned before. And, yeah. you know, she's like in high yeah. school. So they go two towns away to go to Goodwill. Yeah. because they don't she doesn't want to go to school and have the middle class kids see their old clothes on her so they go and get clothes two towns away which is a true thing that that matters to you when you're I remember when I was growing up my brother started dating this girl from the other side of town and um she had all these beautiful clothes and I was four years younger than he was and her mom gave me a bag of her clothes and I had never owned clothes this beautiful I mean they were barely worn tons of these beautiful clothes and people would ask me where I got them like the, I would show up at school looking real cute or whatever and people would be like oh that's so cool where'd you get that and I'd be like I got it at Lee's, which that was her name was Lee, but I acted <laughs> like it was a boutique store that right. I, I, like, oh, I got it at Lee's and I just want to talk about it just because that's so embarrassing, you know, when right. you're, when you're yeah. that age. Yeah. Um, and one of the, you mentioned um, that, and I just, just, you know, to kind of backtrack a little bit, uh, because the other mother recognizes this in her own background, it kind of starts to plant those seeds of empathy as you mentioned but at the same time they're the coming together is not a clean cut thing because they are both fighting as mothers for their own children uh but then brie has two girls who are teenagers and one of which is kind of like a force of nature uh and they both grew up with this privilege and baby robert is going to grow up with this privilege and you know she's kind of measuring this against what's happening what happened to her which she probably had to kind of like was able to put on the shelf for a while and how this is going to come into play when she really just needs to persuade this mother to let baby Robert go and also find out exactly why he was chosen and what it is in the past that caused uh, the baby to be kidnapped. Like there's this race against time to save the baby, but out, what she's also having to, so she has a friend named Marshall who is an ex-cop and he's now an investigator. And he, she grew up with Marshall. Marshall married her very best friend, Betsy, yes. who was also a police person and who was killed on a domestic um, violence call. And um, she and Marshall grew up together. So he helps her because she, you know, she, she's not told anyone. Trey's out of town when this happens. She takes the girls to her mom's house. She's really alone in this, except Marshall joins her. And he has the skill set. So there's also this, like a police procedural, like an investigation going on where clues are uncovered and you learn, you know, the past is unearthed at the same time that this sort of race against time to save Robert is happening. Yeah, it was just such a well, well paved road, a twisty road at that, but well paved. And the relationship between Bree and Marshall was also um, very well done, you know, because Marshall works with Trey. Yes. 
And they After also- Betsy dies, he doesn't want to be a cop anymore because he has a daughter who is the same age as Bree's girls. And he wants to do something safer because there's no safety net. You know, he's right. not a parent. So Trey hires him as a lead investigator at his law firm. And it's, it's not charity. Marshall was one of the youngest people in Atlanta to make detective- the firm was glad to get him. He could he could get a job as an investigator anywhere, but um, but he goes to work there because he and Bree are such good friends, and um, and Bree and Betsy were almost like sisters. So they um, so you know he's connected to all he knows all these people, but Marshall is also middle class, and he's not clinging to the edge of the cliff, but he's you know he's a single father, working class kind of a guy. So. I mean, he grew up definitely blue collar, working class, and now yeah. he's kind of upwardly mobiled himself one or two steps, you know, where he has insurance and savings and things like that. I, I did, I did enjoy uh, some of that, some of Bree's flashbacks to being with Betsy also, because um, that kind of gave like some real interesting insight into, um, you know, like kind of just like who she was as a person and like her guts and where she kind of got them from. Um, and yeah, as, as you said, she doesn't want to tell anybody about what happened because this is what this, you know, she wants to save her son. Um, so again, I'm trying not to give too much away because I have so mm -hmm. many thoughts. Um, I getting know it's hard because I, I'm an, I'm a difficult writer to talk about in terms, like there's two kinds of thrillers. Yeah. There's the kind that you read 80,000 words and then it's like, bang, there's a big twist at the end. So you can talk about the whole thing. But that's not my favorite kind. My favorite kind is by the time you get 25 or 30% of the way in, everything starts flipping and it keeps twisting. Yeah, yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, think, so thinking about the ride without giving away the scenery too much, what you, you, you start, you start to kind of, uncover as I mentioned before gender politics yes. and by gender politics you know I, I mean that things that uh, an oopsie for a woman is very different for an oopsie for a man well why not well, I, I'm going to move away from the book and okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about why that's so important to me so this is nothing from the book and this is not going to spoil anything. so I'm Gen X right and I grew up so that's pre Me Too. And it's fair to say yeah. that, you know, this book is very influenced by the Me Too movement. I was thinking about that. I was thinking about all the ways that we are changing how we talk about gender and sex and parody and stuff like that. When I was in college, I remember when I moved into the dormitory, we had, there were multiple seminars that I went to about how not to get raped on campus. Like it was, it was multiple Mm -hmm. And if you are teaching young women what we should be doing to not be raped, if you get raped, that's whose fault is it? Who's had the seminar on it? We told you how not to get raped. So why are you getting raped? There were no seminars for the boys dorms about how not to rape anyone. Um, <laughs> only <laughs> seminars on how you and that's different now like it's, it's, now that, it's very daughter? different yeah i'm i'm actually um i'm the very tail end of gen x and i very very much remember that in college freshman year this is my daughter Maisie. <laughs> oh welcome Maisie. would you is, Hi. is it okay if Maisie? Yeah, yeah, is so Maisie oh, is a college freshman she just graduated from um high school and she is starting her college career and she's been dealing with this so mm -hmm. talk about how it is now for she is gen z i mean it's not like they they don't give seminars on it but they don't give seminars to the boys and you see all this they put like information like always hold your drink with your never set your drink down and it, it's less like here's a seminar on how not to get raped but they send you stuff constantly that's like don't avoid these behaviors. And when you really think about it, it's not how to prevent rape. It's how to make sure that it's a different girl that get raped. Yeah. Right. Somebody's going to yeah. get raped. Somebody's going to wow. get raped. 
have it not be you. Have it, yeah. have it not let it be you. I know it's just enraging. I, but they do, don't they now teach the boys not to rape people? Um, I mean, there's more of that information out there, mm -hmm. but it's not given, you know, you'd have to seek it out. Wow. I, so, okay. there's, so, so that's interesting. So they don't really talk about um, just like, I guess the, the word is toxic masculinity. Consent. They don't. I mean, when yeah. I was, um, when I did uh, sex ed, like in middle school, the boys and girls curriculums were totally different. And my then boyfriend, we actually had sex ed in the same period. And we would talk after because we were walking the same way out of the classes in the hallway. And our curriculums were entirely different. Like we learned about giving birth and sexually transmitted diseases while they learned about like, male anatomy and STDs. There wasn't consent taught in either gendered course. Mm -hmm. um, there, there wasn't talk about that. And there wasn't much talk of safe sex either. They didn't talk about like condoms or anything like that. Huh. Well, I, I'm kind of disappointed to hear that because you were being told, you know, the, the party line is that things are different now and blah dee -dar. But so, I mean, I guess that makes the book <laughs> even more timely if your sons and daughters aren't getting these talks. But yeah. I, mean, that, I mean, that's not really necessarily super directly related mm. to the book, but at the same time it is because it's very much about it, the different messaging you get if you are male versus female, wealthy versus poor or working class, and also to another degree, white versus black. I mean, yeah. One of the characters at the law firm is a young up and coming person who's on the partner track. She's both black and female. And there's a sub storyline that plays out where if she makes one mistake, she's off the partner track. And if the, you know, there's, there's some things going on at the law firm that if she reports it, the, the older privileged white right old, right, right. With partner is not going to um his career will not be affected even though he's instigating all the problems it's her job to not let those problems interfere with the law firm's business thanks again thanks again Maisie for your input because I think it's um it's you know especially for somebody in that world right now um mm -hmm. you know it's important to hear about it as a mom of, you know, little boys, you know, I do think a lot about how I socialize them and, you know, what the, what the um, ramifications were of, you know, being a woman and growing up where you just kind of expected this. Um, Which is insane, but see, it was so normal at the time, mm -hmm. you know, like that's, that's just how it was. Right. Like n n nobody ever thought, even thought to question it. Yeah, that's and true. and you know, being raised in the South, I, especially in the religious South, I was raised in what they call purity culture, where literally everything's your fault if you're a girl. <laughs> Please don't cause a boy to feel lust. It was it wasn't yeah. even just, you know, you're responsible for if anything bad happens to you. We told you how not to let anything bad happen to you ever, so that's on you. It was don't do all of these things to control men or to, because men can't, help. they have no, they have no agency in this. It's really your problem. If you cause a man to stumble, you know, it's, it's insane. Yeah. Um, but, but it's still, it's so the messaging is still so embedded in our culture that you don't even notice it. I, I definitely agree. Um, and I, I think, you know, indirectly, a lot of, a lot of, um, you know, certain, these questions are, are brought up just so well. And uh, the threads that are kind of woven together, uh, you know, there's a million different twists and turns in this book, um, which. I like that. It's yeah, fun. Yeah, it really, it really was. At, but, but the thing is, again, it's not like there's, di like you said, there's different kind of thrillers. It's not like a bonkers off the wall thriller, which I am not at all bashing. I love those too. Yeah. But this is a thriller that every time a turn comes, you kind of put the book down for a second and you say, huh. And it makes you think about 
something which is, I think, very timely, as you were saying. Yeah, I think I'm trying to write, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, stra I, I've, I'm, a, I'm a very eclectic reader and a huge reader, and I love very commercial fiction. I love the bonkers stuff. And I also like literary fiction. And I'm, I've always written what's called upmarket fiction, which is where you sort of straddle that line uh, or book club fiction. It's like, yeah, you're going to have a good time with this book. There's going to be some kissing and some shooting, pour a drink, go to the beach. But also you can read this in your book club and get a really good talk out of it. Yeah. And, ju and just like, so, and when I changed to writing suspense, as opposed to like family drama or Southern fiction, it really wasn't that big of a change for me because most of my early books, I've always liked, I'm a big suspense reader. There's always a, elements of mystery and suspense in all of my books. And it was really just about switching out the engine. Like it's the same character driven books that are gonna always be looking at faith and justice issues and women's issues just with like a big race car engine put in it like that. <laughs> That's a really good description of it. Um, question, uh, first of all, what are you reading now and what are you working on next? So I I'm gonna tell you what I just finished because I loved it. I just finished The Husbands by Chandler Baker. It's like a gender swapped Stepford Wives. So fun, loved. Um, on my list I, now. Yeah, it's super great. And I just started, like literally last night, I'm maybe 30 pages in, Liberty, which is, um, I don't, I, I don't want to say, it has elements of speculative fiction, but it's more like a historical, it's really, it's like a blend of historical fiction and there's like some magical elements. Um, it yeah. is, it is, it is very, very compelling. Um, the first, I'm a first line person. The first line is, I saw my mother raise a man from the dead. Yeah, I'm going to read that. <laughs> of course. And I believe you, your book technically opens with uh, Brie seeing a witch looking in through her window. Yes, she's, yeah, it's not really, you know, there's no supernatural elements. In no, book, not at all. But it was um, it was a nice touch because it made you it made you think. And of course, you know, the title of the book, Mother May I, which again, you know, there's mothers. It's of, a book about permission. Yes. Consent. It's a book about motherhood. I yeah, my but, I, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't get a title for it. My agent came up with that. I no, it's that. good though, because it has almost like that fairy tale for um, you know, I nursery know. rhyme element to it, which ties into that she thinks she sees a witch but yeah it's the more book nuanced opens than that when yeah the book opens she's asleep and she kind of dreamingly is looking out of her window and she thinks she sees a witch in her backyard standing in her herb garden peering in her bedroom window and she's like what and you know then she she comes all the way awake and the, the person ducks away and they have a six foot privacy fence that's locked like how would a, a, a woman get back there and um and it, it you know it's obviously the woman who later that day is going to take her child is already stalking them you have like a nursery rhyme type title and it has almost a fa like it starts with a false fantasy start um and i liked that very very much about about it so yeah um that was like it was a very nice touch so uh, you really you know that that should draw people in right away um so are you working on anything next i am i am writing a book called with my little eye which is about the it's about the male gaze and it's about the gaze of avarice like it's 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 a the the narrator is a television actor who was on a, like a 90s sitcom like she, the way she would put it is you know you may not know my name but you would know my face and it's now current times and she's sort of made a living um doing <laughs> like those guest spots on law and order where she always turns out to be the murderer or she gets killed um yeah, you you know you know if the 90s actor shows up on law and order they're the either time, yeah. the killer or 
right yeah going yes. to die horribly yep, absolutely so she and the first line of that you know i'm a first line person the first line of that book is, and she has a stalker that she's have left la with her daughter to get away from him it's become that bad and a lot of things film here in atlanta so um and the first line is i never thought i was famous enough to get murdered <laughs> it's, Okay, I already want to read it. Yay! <laughs> well, thanks so much for talking about it. Thank you so much for Maisie for her input. Um, you know, like you mentioned, it's very difficult to discuss your books without giving too much away, but there's a lot of pieces to... Um, there's a lot of um, destinations on this map because I know we've talked about it a lot as like a journey, a lot of destinations on this map that uh, I think a lot of people are going to feel the bumps while they're going through it and they're going to think about things in their own past or ways that people they know or themselves were socialized and while the thrills are coming it will give it will bring up some questions and i think this is a very good uh, book club book because you you want you're going to want to discuss it with people i want to discuss it with you right now and i don't want to give any spoilers away so please 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 just read the book take it out from your library purchase it from bookshop.org mother may i and um never have i ever or any of jocelyn's um books because I think that they're great. Thank you so much for having me on and letting me talk to librarians, especially. Um, I, you know, I was pretty much raised in libraries and I think that you guys are literally the most egalitarian institution we have left in this country. Oh, thank and you. I and I, I, I know also you guys are the dealers who dispense my drug of choice. So I'm, <laughs> I'm very grateful to have a chance to talk to this audience in particular about Mother May I. It's funny. I think that I think the modern term now is influencer, which the, <laughs> the first time I heard like so and so is an influencer, I was like, what is that? You know, because as I said, I'm the tail end of Gen X and we don't know all of this stuff right away. It's not like natural to us. So someone's like, oh, she's an influencer. Well, what's an influencer? And then the more we started working on this podcast and then after, um, COVID hit and we started making book review videos for our web, you know, the library's website and Facebook, I was like, ooh, the influencers are us. And maybe that's what we've always done because we even not in COVID times, when people come and they ask us for a book, we say, have you read Mother May I? This book has everything. So um, <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, I thank you very much for, um, for uh, that. And we're more than happy to dispense your drug of choice. Thank you, Jessica. All right. So with that, um, I'm going to sign us off. Uh, this was Jessica with Turn the Page Podcast, Sayasa Public Library. Uh, our guest today was Jocelyn Jackson. And we are going to close this chapter of Turn the Page. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode. <laughs>